So we've got one more speaker in, in this session, but the session topic is changing, or the, the theme of it. So we're moving from biodiversity and monitoring to habitat and connectivity. And the presenter of this paper that's actually, I guess, prepared by Olivia Berg, who's a postdoc at Manaki Whenua, land care research at Lincoln, but it's being presented by Grant Norbury, who's also a, uh, an ecologist, animal ecologist with Manaki Whenua, based in Alexandra, and Grant has a, many years of experience working in dry land ecosystems, but I'm not quite sure why he's presenting this, but he may tell us. So join with me in welcoming um, Grant. What a good question that is. So uh, that's because Olivia, neither Olivia, John, Neil or Sarah could make it, so they give their apologies. So kia ora koutou again. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. I'll do my best. Don't ask me any tricky questions. But um, it, I think you'll enjoy it because it's really important work. This is all about the bottom-up processes when we're trying to restore uh, birds in this case. There's nothing about predation. It's about habitat. Um, and um, uh, so these are the questions they're asking. How much habitat is there? Again, I'll just go back again. What, what we're talking about here has generic application if you're worried about these issues of habitat connectivity. I'm going to give you examples from Cape to City, but it, the, the modelling approach these guys are using has generic application. Um, how much habitat is there in Cape to City? and how well connected is, is it. And that's important for bird dispersal. It's a natural dispersal, and it's also important when you translocate birds into these systems. Um, uh, so let's, let's, let's have a look at it. Uh, this, this is data from the Land Cover Database 4, uh, from the Cape to City footprint. And the top, this one here is the top section of the footprint. That's the middle section, and that's the bottom section. And there's the habitats on the bottom there. And it's just showing the cover, the cover levels. And in the north, there's a lot of pine forest that's about to be cleared, by the way, a lot of that forest. In fact, it's being cleared as we speak, I believe. In the middle, uh, there's not quite so much exotic forest. Down the bottom, that's where most of the indigenous forest is. So that's the situation in Cape to City. Um, and then... Uh, defining connectivity, how do you do that? that? Well, they're defining it this way, that the amount of reachable habitat or good habitat is a function of either it being large single patches or small patches that are connected, uh, or a combination of both. That's the definition of connectivity. And um, have I missed any slides there? No, OK. Uh, so let's get into the, some methods here. So they used a modelling approach. and. It starts off here, they've got species on the left, and then you're looking at the habitat required. I'm talking about birds here, and we're really just talking about three species of bird, robin, tui, kakariki, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, but they're basically looking at what are the habitat requirements of those three bird species. That's based on uh, expert opinion in this case. And then down the bottom, they're also looking at the extent to which those birds are able to disperse. And so they're looking at a connection probability. And that's based on expert opinion, but also on the literature. And then what you do is you combine those two big circles into what's called a conifer analysis. And you spit out a map of what are functionally connected regions and the map of the critical areas. So that stuff is the results on the right hand side. OK, so now what they did was they took those LCDB4 habitat uh, categories and they ranked the quality of those habitats for Tui, Robin, Kakariki. So you can see that all three species love broadleaf indigenous hardwood forest. Uh, uh, and then you can go down that list. They don't go into those other areas. 11, indigenous forest. It seems to be a different category in LCDB. They love those as well. And so on and so forth. 15 there, Manuka, Kanuka, successional shrub, uh, scrub, a tui to some extent use it, so do Robin to some extent, Kakarihi, and et cetera, et cetera. OK, so that's based on expert opinion. Right, now you've got to bring in dispersal. And this is based again on the literature and expert opinion. And you'll see here there's big differences. So a Robin, the maximum distance, apparently, that robins have been recorded to move is 110 metres. So they're very limited by dispersal. And in brackets, the similar species there are riflemen, whitehead, saddleback, North Island, Kokaka. 
Two are a different story, 20 kilometres, so they're more mobile, similar bellbird and kiwi. Kakariki are real, they, they are, you know, on steroids, off they go, right across that land, landscape. So um, what they did was they looked at a probability, it's, you can't just base it on maximum movement, because not every bird does a maximum movement. So they, they, they had a probability function that they described, and we're going to talk about here about the probability of a greater than 50% probability of an animal crossing a particular set of patches. Okay, that's, that's what they used. You can't just use maximum distances, it, it's misleading. So here's some results, right. So on the left there is Robin, and this is just the habitat value that they've scored. Uh, if it's light coloured, it's not very high. If it's dark blue, it's high value habitat for Robin. And you can see that for robin, there's actually quite a lot of habitat. The, fr the pine forest is not top notch, but it's not too bad. The good stuff's down the bottom. Robin have got lots of habitat, relatively speaking. Tui in the middle also do have uh, a similar amount of habitat, but it's not as quite as high quality for robin as it is for robin. And kakariki are, are, are much more habitat limited. So that's just quality. Now what they did was they, they weighted the habitat based on the area of the habitat. So big chunks are better than smaller chunks of the same value, if you understand what I mean. So for Robin, uh, uh, the big chunks are good for them. Uh, Tui, uh, similar. Uh, I'm just trying to think how that works with the top. And then for Kakariki, uh, there's not so much. So it's weighted on the basis of good quality. I think that the, they're particularly red up there for robin is that, that because they're quite close. So that matches pretty well the habitat uh, quality uh, slide I showed you before. But because Tui are more mobile, they can access some of these. Yeah, anyway, I'm being a bit vague there because I don't understand details. There you go, that's the problem with giving a talk to someone else. Now, now what they're doing is they are looking at the dispersal ability. You can see robin there's only five connections there that Robin can do, and you can't see them because they're very small little pieces of black line, uh, and that's based on a 50% probability. Very, very few. For Tui, it's a different story. They can move around the landscape. Kakariki, they just black it out because they can access everything. So that's important. Now, here's the distance between all the habitat patches. It's got nothing to do with bird dispersal. If you just draw uh, di measure distances between every single habitat patch in that landscape, that's the distribution you get. So it's, you know, the, there's very few that are far apart. A lot of them are around about uh, 10, 10 kilometres. For robin, uh, that's their maximum dispersal. You can see that there's very few patches, very few that they can access. So now what they've done is they've ranked the 10 most important patches for habitat and connectivity, which is useful for management. Um, the 10 uh, most important for robin are up in the north because they can't move very far. Tui, it's a different story. They can access these. So these are based on the quality of the habitats. What are the 10 most important patches for, for retaining uh, uh, them for, connect for connection? So what are the conclusions? The most important patches for habitat and connectivity for Robin and Tui were the existing forestry plantations in the northern portions of the footprint and they're ready for clearance. They're being cleared right now. This is a really important one, the second one. Trying to enhance connectivity by planting between patches for obligate forest birds, and that's what we're talking about here, forest birds, um, is largely futile, they're arguing in the Cape to City footprint. Um, so this is, for, uh, th this is for robin, which are forest obligates. They're talking about robin there. If you want to enhance robin, uh, uh, it's going to be a long process. They're, they're suggesting that for takariki, uh, kakariki and tui, or similar birds that can reach existing habitat, they just need more of the habitat. So they're arguing that we need to uh, get better quality habitat in the footprint rather than trying to link up patches. Uh, because it's a long-term process. So the management context for Cape to City in particular is to retain the exotic forestry. That's a vexed question. And assess what land's available, either legally or politically, for habitat creation. 
the, this issue we're talking about, about creating just more of good quality habitat. So they're looking at other things like to what extent can we facilitate riparian plantings, roadside plantings, other areas. And they're saying that planting food trees in private gardens and farms for Tui and Bellbird, Kaka, Kereru, might be a better strategy. And focus on bird species that don't require a large amounts of forest. So they're suggesting other things like wetland birds that are listed there, um, species that enjoy rough pasture, species that are beach dwellers, species that are connected to rivers. So they're kind of uh, uh, challenging the paradigm, I guess, for Cape to City because it is so disconnected that a better approach would be to enhance these kinds of habitats for other bird species, not just forest birds. Oh, this is what Campbell wanted us to make sure we talked about, but I think we already have, that, that uh, we need more planning of habitat restoration across farmland and urban areas and a better understanding of the link between planting and species benefit, which is exactly what they're talking about here. Um, yeah, that's it. So um, there you go. <laughs> Thanks. Well done. Any questions for Grant? We've got five minutes or so. John, I think John McLennan should stand up and answer all these before I get them. Because <laughs> John McLennan is a bird expert, not myself. Sorry, John. <laughs> no, there's a question there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm from the, I'm from the Poverty Bay. Can you use the speakers? And, um, the, the microphone. Could you use the microphone? Thanks. My concern, my concern uh, up our way for, uh, for the birds is when they are going to stop um, helicopters dropping this T-80 in our ears, which is a big, big problem to humans as well. Uh, we are at a loss to, to know where to turn to now. Mm. I, as a beekeeper, are very near ready to chuck, chuck it in. Um, is there any uh, light on the horizon for us as uh, bushmen? Thank you. I didn't expect that question. No. <laughs> John will answer that. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> Bruce is... No, it's a serious question. That's fine. Bruce will be No, I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer that. And, and it comes up frequently. And, and yesterday, um, Ali McDonald gave a talk on people's different values. And... Um, obviously there's mixed values in this room about the value of 1080 and whether it should be used in, or not. And I think that's a, a, a topic for a, a whole other seminar or even a conference and it's not something we can answer here. Um, but we hear your concern and you're not alone in that concern. Um, and I think research is trying to find solutions but those solutions aren't quickly found, but they are trying to be found. So I just want to sort of hold that conversation there, but hopefully that answers your question um, to some extent. So thank you. So, yep. Uh, just a question about those dispersal, is that on? Uh, uh, the dispersal distances, I'm wondering about how how transparent or opaque that landscape is if you've got uh, falcons re-emerging in there, especially for kākāriki. Mm. It's a land year we found first first transfer of kākāriki uh, took quite an impact from falcons because they were naive to them, where they had come from. So you're asking about dis the issue of dispersal and, yeah, and the, the measurements. Yeah. But if they've got falcons in there, that can okay. really limit sure. the falcons. I can't answer your question about that. You got any comment, John McLennan? <coughs> this is great. I've got two people standing here taking my <laughs> questions. Um, I, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, um, there aren't enough falcons in the area at the moment to actually limit dispersal distances of Kakariki. Uh, it'll be nice when falcons do turn up. But um, for the moment, they are going far and wide through the footprint. And they... Um, uh, there are indications of mortality, but it's not from falcons, um, both in uh, p partly but mainly outside the footprint. They're being nailed by cats, so it tends to be a one-way journey. Yeah, thanks. Stay here, John. <laughs> 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 
Sorry, I think this is a question for you, Grant. Um, I just wonder what the capacity is for Manaki Whenua, Manaki Whenua to do this sort of work in other project areas. I think for farmers, to have a conference of farmers in an area, to see a map like that and to realise the influence that they can have on doing, making a difference would have a huge impact. So yeah. I'd love you to come to the Forest Bridge Trust. Yeah. I mean, that's what I mean about, that's why I enjoy, I've said to it in my previous talk here, why I enjoy working for Cape to City, because the project management team are interested in questions that apply across the country. Uh, it's not just as for Cape to City, and, and you're right, it, this applies to ev what everyone's dealing with and what Bruce talked about this morning. It's very relevant. And that's just done for three species there, you know. If you've got particular species you're more interested in, then they have to look heavily into the literature on the dispersal and the habitat requirements. Yeah, happy to help. Manaki Fenua would like to help you. I've got a, a quick question about that word futile for some of the corridors. Mm. Uh, you may be aware of the Marai Totara River restoration. So there's, there's one very important corridor that's going south. The second point I'd like to make is basically something that I've discussed with, with Bruce quite often, and is that, like in Taranaki, the riparian strips are actually far too narrow and should become a lot wider, especially for robins to find habitat in such places. Mm -hmm. So those are two considerations, and that comes in nicely with the farming question out there, bingo. So we're actually starting to work towards that plan that Campbell wanted you to touch on. Is yeah, uh, I'll apologise on behalf of them. They use the word futile, not a good word to use. But you appreciate what they're trying to say, yeah. yeah. But that issue of habit of corridor width and so forth is really important. It's, it was good to hear that this morning. And also your points, uh, Bruce, about successional planting. Um, the people generally go in and they put a swag of species in and then kind of walk away, I guess, rather than thinking about when is it ready to bring in the next successional components. That's really cool. Yeah, if I could just comment on that, that word futile. I, I disagree with the word futile um, and that's because it all comes down to the width of the corridor. So in fact the corridor could be as, as good as the patch that's being discussed depending on how big the corridor was. And so um, I guess the other bit about the successional planting that's really important is that if you put in your first crop and then do walk away, usually at about year 12, year 15, and we've got data on this, the early pioneer plants will be starting to die and the canopy will be opening up. Uh, the weeds will start coming in big time. And so the issue really is, what is the plan? Is the riparian planting considering what will happen, say, at year 12, year 15? And is it considering places along the river corridor where it may be possible to widen the riparian? You know, there are all sorts of ways that you can do this. And actually, in their results, they talked about um, public and private land. So, you know, the Esplanade Reserve is the classic example. We have huge amounts of Esplanade Reserve across New Zealand, which is public land, which, and in some cases, it's extremely wide. And so the question is to find the juxtaposition of the opportunity of a willing landowner and the public land and broaden this corridor out. Thanks. <laughs> 